On June 23rd, 2020, the studio Stellar Jockeys, which created the cult 2016 indie mech game Brigador, announced that one of the company's co-founders was suspending his involvement with the studio after a series of incriminating screenshots from a private forum were leaked, showing him posting, in his own words, transphobic, racist, and anti-Semitic remarks. This man's name was Jack Monahan, better known by his online handle of Gaussworks, or just Gauss for short. In the announcement, he issued an apology, which I personally have a hard time believing was genuine considering the leak showed that he had been posting slurs literally seven days prior. Also keep in mind that at this point, Jack Monahan was a man in his 40s who was married and had two kids, and he had been posting all this under his main handle. This isn't some youthful indiscretion or trolling on a throwaway account. This is him speaking genuinely and openly to like-minded individuals on a private forum he thought would never see the light of day. Then three days later, on June 26, 2020, the popular YouTube channel Mandalore Gaming released a video review of Brigador. His review praised the game's aesthetics, its high skill ceiling, the variety of playable vehicles, and its dedication to its unique lore. But one thing conspicuously absent from his review was even a casual mention of Jack Monahan's hate speech. It's not that Mandalore didn't know about it, because he was in the Stellar Jockeys Discord when the whole thing was going down, and even reassuring Jack's brother Hugh afterward. I know this because I was also in the Discord at the time. I tried to go back and get some screenshots for this video, but looks like they've all either been deleted or hidden. Luckily, Discord search at least autocompletes Mandalore's account when you start typing it in, so you can see that he's been there. In the aftermath of Mandalore's video, there was a huge spike in sales for Brigador, and I can't help but wonder how many of the people who bought the game would have done so if they'd known there was a possibility their money could be going to a man like Jack Monahan. It's been over half a year since then, and nothing has really happened. No major gaming journalists or sites did a story on Jack Monahan or Stellar Jockeys, other than to promote that GOG.com was giving away free copies back in December. Jack Monahan is still listed on Stellar Jockeys' website, their merch store is full of his art, and a few weeks ago the pseudonymous Stellar Jockeys team even started selling statues that are 3D prints of the ZBrush renders Jack Monahan made of the pilots. His personal website is still up, and while he has blanked out his portfolio on ArtStation, he is still active there and has been posting likes as recently as a day ago. He deleted his Twitter account back in June, but somebody re-registered it this month. And this makes me worried that he might be thinking that he can come back. In Jack's own leaked post, he mocked developers that were whipped and speculated at length that you could get away with ignoring the SJWs because the unwoke were a big enough audience to make up for it. And when he stepped down, the Stellar Jockeys community was full of people who were outspoken in not only defending him, but actively supporting his statements, or saying that it didn't matter if he was a bigot as long as he made good games. And thanks to Mandalore, Brigador has sold very well while being untouched by the controversy. Jack Monahan is someone who spent over a decade pretending to be a friend and ally to the LGBTQ community in the name of advancing his career and selling his products, while avidly talking about how we're all subhuman behind closed doors. When the news came out, I felt terrible for having supported him, and I know that there are many, many other people who would feel similarly, which is ultimately why I am making this video. I know that if the shoe was on the other foot, I would want someone to inform me about a person like Jack Monahan before I spent money that could possibly be going to them. Also, Jack's story is just an interesting one, especially with the recent discourse about the way that the internet radicalizes people and how the image of bigots as unwashed basement-dwelling losers is so inaccurate, following his trajectory from aspiring concept artists doing paintings of memes in 2007 to hate-filled transphobe living a double life in 2020 has been a fascinating case study. This video is going to follow the entire path start to finish as best I've been able to piece together. The video description will have relevant links, but please keep in mind that this is basically a loose oral history and I'm doing the best I can considering a lot of the original posts have been hidden, uh, edited, deleted, or from leaked sources. This all starts with the website Something Awful. It was an internet comedy site that was founded in 1999 but mostly became known for its forums. Its gimmick was that it cost $10 to register an account there, which effectively filtered out the children and trolls that made forums unreadable back then. It also had strict moderation, with rules requiring proper spelling and grammar, as well as banning catchphrases and images that we would now refer to as memes. This meant that it attracted a comparatively older and sophisticated user base, at least by the standards of Web 1.0. Jack Monahan registered for this forum on February 8, 2001, under his now ubiquitous handle, Gauss. On Something Awful, the forum was broken up into different subforums based on specific topics. The most popular one by far was Games, the subforum for video games. As was the trend at the time, there were a lot of arguments and smack talk about which consoles were best. When the seventh generation of home video game consoles came out in 2006, the console warriors started to get particularly rowdy, so as a compromise, the administrators of the Something Awful forums created a special new soap forum, Your Console Sucks. 
Well, it was originally created as a containment zone for all the annoying arguing and trolling about how the PS3 has no games and the Wii was for babies. The relaxed rules and casual atmosphere meant that your console sucks, or YCS for short, quickly drifted away from its stated purpose and instead became more of a hangout and a place for shitposting, branching out into other topics, like a prolific thread dedicated to mocking bad webcomics. A number of gaming media and entertainment figures got their start on this obscure little board, like Ben, Yahtzee, Croshaw, and Nick Babylonian Robinson. Some actual established game developers posted there too. Most famous was probably Joshua Robekid Sawyer, a former Black Isle developer who would go on to be the director and lead designer of Fallout New Vegas, and would even include hidden references to YCS in it, such as the unique weapon, the YCS-186. The flip side to this relaxed atmosphere and lack of moderation was that, even for the time, it was a pretty edgy place. There was an infamous anecdote about a poster who was so used to using slurs that when he left a voicemail on his parents' phone, he accidentally referred to himself as your F-word son because he had internalized the word so much and was subsequently mortified when he realized what he had done. YCS went from 2007 to 2011, so I know this was a different time and all, but I still feel like that's an important piece of set dressing for all this. This community is where Gauss started to really make a name for himself, both for his artwork and his appreciation for immersive sims like Deus Ex and Thief. He was also able to give direct insight into the workings of game development and the industry at large, since he was employed by an indie game studio called 8 Monkey Labs and doing level design artwork for a game called Darkest of Days. It was a first-person shooter with the gimmick of you playing as a time traveler and fighting in historical battles with advanced futuristic weaponry. It sounded really cool, and even if it was in Gauss's own self-interest to hype up the game, a lot of people were looking forward to it. I think the real breakout for Jack Monahan on the forums was a little thing called the Zyborn Clock. It was a hilarious train wreck where back in 2003, a group of forums posters with no actual programming or game design skills tried to create an RPG. The project imploded in the span of a month, but in that time a lot of really hilarious amateur artwork and writing was generated for it. It's way beyond the scope of this video for me to cover it all, but if you're unfamiliar with it, you should totally go look it up. Anyway, around 2007, people rediscovered the Cyborn Clock and started making fan art and memes about it, and Jack Monahan's art stood above the crowd. Specifically, he made art of Johnny Five Aces. With his lumpy head, awkward posture, prominent moose knuckle, and the fact that he's playing poker with five aces, Johnny was a favorite character for people to draw fan art of. And by virtue of being older and more experienced than most of the other people on the board, Jack Monaghan was able to blow everyone away with his detailed and skilled artwork of Johnny. His illustrations circulated far and wide afterward. On September 10th, 2009 was the release of Darkest of Days, and the reviews were not kind. On Metacritic, the PC version has an average review score of 51 from critics, and the Xbox 360 version being even less fortunate with a score of 44. And this isn't a case of the snooty, out-of-touch critics not appreciating a game, because the user reviews are almost exactly the same. I can even speak from personal experience. I played the game when it came out because the premise was interesting and it had a good, funny, Portal-esque trailer. Try the AMP-60 with auto-assist targeting full of shit rounds. And you can use the CO7 shotgun for everything. It's a shotgun. But the actual game was just not very fun. It was kind of a cautionary tale about small independent development studios biting off more than they can chew. The time travel premise was a killer one, but they just didn't have the resources to do more than a few time period. So 90% of the game is you running around the same World War II and American Civil War backdrops using period weapons. And while it tried to be story driven, the actual plot was really predictable for anyone with any genre of literacy about time travel stories at all. There were a few bright spots like dealing with the fallout of one of your future weapons being found by a confederate soldier, or the quips from your partner teasing you about all the cool modern things you missed out on by being born in the 1800s, but for the most part it was just really disappointing and even ended with a sequel hook rather than a proper ending. The most vicious review out there is the one that Jim Sterling wrote for Destructoid, in which he gave it a 1 out of 10 and declared it the worst first person shooter of this generation. I'm not a fan of Jim Sterling as a critic or as a smirking specter forever haunting my YouTube recommendations, but I bring it up because he's probably the biggest name to give Darkest of Days any attention, and it being with a review that obviously takes a lot of joy in tearing down a game that didn't have a lot of clout must have been something that really stung to the people who worked on the game. And knowing the path that Jack Monahan would go down, especially given how much of the dumb online culture warrior crap of the mid-2010s was based around people being mad at video game critics, it makes me wonder if this was a formative moment for him going down the path of hatred and bigotry. I'm not trying to defend Jack Monahan or imply that the critics bear some responsibility, but trying to put together all the pieces, and this definitely feels like it could be a big one. 
After Darkest of Days shipped, Jack Monahan spent the rest of 2009 and 2010 writing a series of blog posts called Design Reboot, where he would apply his own game design philosophy to extant game franchises and write little pitches for how he would have done them, complete with his own original artwork. As a huge fan of the 2000 game Deus Ex, the first one I ever saw was one he wrote detailing a hypothetical prequel game about the characters of Anna Navarra and Gunther Herman. Probably the best one was the one he did about the infamous 2007 flop Clive Barker's Jericho, where he breaks down the fundamental failure of making a squad-based game where every character is the same color palette and outline, and redesigns them to stand out more and have more personality. Other treatments were a bit more out there and experimental, like re-envisioning Alone in the Dark as a home invasion game where you are literally alone in the dark, or a world where Half-Life still used the original design for Gordon Freeman and never found an audience. This was a project that got a lot of positive attention and even had its own forum and community, attracting a lot of aspiring game designers because of how clearly and confidently he discussed different game design philosophies and drew on his own experience as a character and level designer. That's why I wanted to include it in this video. It shows that he wasn't some shut-in lurking in the shadows of an obscure sub-forum, but a person who was actively and publicly engaging with the gaming community and had a lot of younger and less experienced people looking up to him. So when we go over the fallout of his outing, you'll understand why people were so shocked and felt so betrayed. Around the same time, Your Console Sucks was experiencing a fall from grace. As time went on, the community got rowdier and edgier. It was hemorrhaging older posters and driving off new ones with how abrasive and insular they had become, and the Greater Something Awful community started taking note. In a frankly shocking display of forward thinking, in 2011, the remaining members of Your Console Sucks decided that they would create their own website and move the community off-site before Something Awful had a chance to shut them down. The name of that website was BadGame.net. The website was and is closed to the public. Only people who have an account can even access it, and they screen their applicants because I tried to make an account for this video and didn't have any luck. Going off the leaks, it's just an internet forum, but the fact that it's locked away from public view means that any restraint people were exercising out of fear of the something awful moderators was now gone. It was an insular community and an echo chamber, and I can see how that environment would become toxic and radicalizing over time. I only have the leaks to go off of, but I'll do my best to piece things together from here on out. Driven by the failure of Darkest of Days, Jack Monahan would decide to make his own game instead of being part of somebody else's team. Jack Monahan and his brother Hugh founded the game studio Stellar Jockeys, later bringing on a writer slash programmer named Carl Perra Kennings. In 2012, they announced they had started on the project of their dreams, Brigador, an isometric mech game with tank controls and destructible environments, emphasizing punishing difficulty and targeting the kind of dedicated, obsessive gamer that they felt was being underserved by the modern industry. It was a natural fit for Jack Monahan's love of military tech and sci-fi dystopias. They worked on it for years, living together in a small house, churning out lovingly detailed mechs and cities full of civilians to squash, and all the while, Jack Monahan was posting on Bad Game, giving updates about the development and answering questions. They were lucky enough to get the synthwave musician Makeup and Vanity set to score the game. They were so sure that the game was going to be a cult hit, they even commissioned an entire audiobook of lore to be included with the deluxe editions of the game. He also threw in lots of in-jokes, like Johnny Five Aces as a pilot and a vehicle named the Rope Kid and buildings with YCS signs on them. And when the game finally launched in 2016, it landed with a thud. Based on the flashy trailers, gamers had been expecting a story-driven twin-stick shooter and instead were given an intentionally kludgy and opaque score attack game, where the only story content is huge lore dumps you can buy using in-game currency. The grudgy visuals and Makeup and Vanity Set soundtrack were both praised, but as an actual game, the silent majority of hardcore gamers they betted on never materialized, and what few critics did review it were mixed. Although on the plus side, this time Destructoid gave him an 8 out of 10. When the game failed to sell or be critically acclaimed, Jack Monahan's brother Hugh managed to use that to his advantage as a way of drawing attention to the game and themselves. He wrote a post on Imager breaking down the toll that indie game development had taken on him and his brother, going viral with a post on the Steam forums in which he tore down a poster complaining that $20 was too much to ask for a game, and eventually even getting a speaking gig at GDC 2017, going over the game's failures and what lesson they had learned from it. In a weird way, Hugh managed to make the game's failure be an asset. Over time, Brigador managed to do well enough that in 2019, Stellar Jockeys announced that they were making a sequel. Brigador Killers would be a story-driven take on Brigador's gameplay, where you were charged with hunting down the pilots from the previous game. It seemed like Stellar Jockeys had learned from their past mistakes, and the future was looking bright. Then, in June of 2020, the leak happened. The way the Something Awful forums are set up, you can pay real-world money to change the avatars of other posters on the forum. This process is completely anonymous, so it's usually used as a way of insulting someone by buying them an ugly or demeaning avatar out of spite. 
In this instance, though, the leaker purchased multiple avatars for posters in the Brigador thread that linked to a collection of screenshots of Jack Monaghan's BadGame.net posts, showing him engaging in sexist, transphobic, homophobic, xenophobic, and anti-Semitic discourse. When these screenshots were discovered and posted in the thread, the Brigador fans initially dismissed them as fake or hoax, but then a day later, Jack Monaghan himself confirmed the posts were real. He issued an apology to the forums and on Twitter, saying that he was sorry for what he said and that he would be working on improving himself as a person, but considering some of the posts in the leak were as recent as a week prior, it was hard to take it as anything other than an attempt at damage control. Additionally, the vague wording of the apology and lack of clear answers from Hugh and Carl meant that there was no guarantee that Jack was no longer receiving money from the sales of Brigador or its upcoming sequel. Carl and Hugh did both, however, disavow any knowledge of Jack's bigotry or his connections to BadGame.net. While this was going on, the leaker or leakers were continuing to put out screen caps showing BadGame.net's reaction to their comrade-in-arms falling on his sword. And they tell a different story. In these leaks, the members of Bad Game talk about how Hugh Monahan and Carl Para Kennings were also members of the forum and express bafflement and anger at what they see as a betrayal, making Jack Monahan jump on the metaphorical grenade for the good of the company when they were just as guilty. Now, my skeptical side says that the posters on Bad Game could just be making shit up. After all, there were no leaked defensive posts from Hugh or Carl. But if you look at the picture of their living spaces when they were making the game, I have a really hard time believing that Hugh could just be totally oblivious to whatever Jack was doing considering their monitors were literally right next to each other. And also, like, five seconds on Google showed that Carl Para Kennings was coding for the BadGame.net website on his GitHub. So yeah, that was all a fucking lie. They knew about the site this entire time. So, here we are. In the end, a guy I thought was really cool turned out to be a piece of shit. I hope he eventually does become a better human being because I'm a compassionate person and I like to think that people can change. But it's going to be a long, long time before I spend money on anything he or Stellar Jockeys make, and I hope you'll do the same. If you're watching this video and you're a member of BadGame.net or other similar communities, I just want you to know it's not too late. You can always log off, step away from the computer, make new friends, stop living a life of obsessive online hatred and misanthropy, and get with the times. If nothing else, just walk away to avoid being dragged down with the rest of them. One of the leaked posts is a bad game poster being mad that he got banned from his Final Fantasy XIV guild in the aftermath of the original leaks, which is really funny, but also not surprising at all. I think in a way, the fandom that sprung up around Brigadora is itself a kind of perfect refutation to the hateful and exclusionary worldview that Jack Monaghan espoused, because it is one that is incredibly inclusive. The streamer Casey Explosion made a great observation, that she and many other trans people were vocal supporters of Brigador, which made it all the more disappointing that Jack Monaghan would privately consider them to be subhuman and talk about how their opinions didn't matter because they didn't even play real games. So that's how I think I want to end this video. Put all that hate behind us and end with a hover bike honking for trans rights. Honk for trans rights! Honk! Oh, wow!